Brought to you by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast equipment rentals in Brooklyn, New York. JMRNY.com. And now get 15% off your first rental when you use the promo code WEEKEND. Call 347-721-3400 or email info at jmrny.com for details. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and joining me via Zoom today, she is an accomplished filmmaker, and her short film, Killing Evan, is currently making its way around the festival circuit, Miss Taylor Landisman. Welcome, Taylor. Hey, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you. Um, we met uh, at Greenpoint Film Festival, uh, and you were kind enough to, to give us a quote about the festival. Uh, where your film was playing, which was good. Um, I want to talk to you about the film, but I also kind of want to talk to you about your background and your day job, because I think that's interesting as well. So um, without further to do, uh, how did you get in the show business? Uh, what is your origin story? Well, for me, I feel like it really all started in this crummy little basement on the Upper East Side at um, this private school called Rudolf Steiner. I was in my high school film class and I remember my professor sort of gave us this assignment. Um, it was to, he gave us this assignment of four images. He laid them out on the table and he was like, what do you think the order of the sequence is in the film that we're about to watch? And it was a basically horses roaming a pasture. It was pigeons about to, to mid flight, a still of pigeons mid flight. Um, it was cows grazing a field. And then it was a face of a woman. And we had to sort of figure out which one first or second or third or fourth. And as we were sort of trying to think of the seat and all of us one, you know, had our hand, hand in and we're like, oh, this is so obvious. Obviously, you, you know, it starts on the woman's face and then it goes to the pigeons and then back to the woman's face. And we were all just sort of like doing live editing with paper. Um, and then he was like, all right, good work, everyone. And then he dimmed the lights, turned on the 16 millimeter projector and he began to play Chris Marker's La Jete. And I think all of our minds at that moment were totally blown. <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? You can, a film can be a poem. A film can be just stills. A film can be voiceover and stills and a sci-fi uh, dystopian narrative without any of the big VFX or the big budget. You could literally just go out with a, you know, a still camera and make a film. Um, and you know, I think that was really like that moment. I think everyone talks about that moment where they feel like that was my vocational calling. That was, <laughs> that was my vocational calling to film. And I, you know, you know, fast forward maybe six years and then I'm sort of in editing room making visual live visuals for Frank Ocean and Beyonce and, you know, creating all these sort of animations that were very much informed by my experience in, of going of studying experimental film in undergrad. Um, I did not have like the traditional film school, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a traditional film school upbringing, as one might say. Um, so, yeah, from there, I'm, I'm work making live visuals for you know big famous pop stars and kind of honing in my chops VFX wise and animation wise, but it wasn't really until uh, I started working on a Roger Waters documentary that I sort of honed in my narrative skills and I was assisting on that. And I sort of got into the narrative assisting world. And from there, I sort of, you know, worked my way from, you know, cutting commercials, cutting lower budget indies, um, things like that. And eventually, you know, I decided to just sort of go on my own and break away from the editing world and become more of a writer, you know, learn how to produce, direct. And this was sort of my, you know, official film school making this short. For you, you've worked on, uh, you come from the perspective of an editor, which I think is a great way to start because you get to see where like the, the end product and deal with, like, you know what editors deal with. So now you know how to shoot for an edit kind of thing. Um, and you've worked for, I talked to this, um, I talked about this a little bit with uh, Barry Alexander Brown when he was on the show, 
because his day job is is editing. And I know that you also recently worked on a Spike Lee project as well. Uh, Barry's worked on some big films with Spike, and uh, you worked on the the Epicenters project. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the process of that? Like when you have a big project like that, because you're dealing with footage that he shot, you're dealing with archival footage, you're dealing with, I mean, you're just getting sources from everywhere. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm assuming you're, you weren't the only editor on that project. It was probably a team of you guys. Yeah. It Talk was, a little bit about like the, the flow of that and how that works. You know, I don't, I don't know how much I can actually talk about the actual workflows and sort of so much of the behind the scenes. I was an assistant on it, actually. I wasn't an editor. I, uh, I did work with Barry, but I was assisting Adam Goff, who also um, cut to Five Bloods with Spike. And he's also cut uh, you know, just a little film called Roma. Not sure if you heard of it, um, <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, from an editorial point of view, it was something I had never encountered in terms of that workflow because it was such a robust project. And I think, you know, the difference between narrative and documentary is documentary, you're really finding, you're searching for the story in the edit. You do not, you are not, you know, once you have a narrative, it is in the can, you just only have so much footage to work with. But this was an endless stream. Da dailies coming in, a shoot's going on outside the door. You got archival coming in, you know, it was, it was nonstop um, because, and as it should be, you know, he, Spike was figuring out the story in the edit and he was searching and he was asking questions and he wanted to continue to discover through that process. And, you know, I think that's a really beautiful thing. A lot of people, you know, a lot of documentarians don't have the money to sort of do that. Um, you know, documentary filmmaking, it is, it's a marathon and it's more, and you, the workflow, the work, the time that it takes, it is, it, it's incredibly, grueling but it is certainly worth it in terms of like the depth of the story I think he was trying to tell um but again just you know able to work with such talent like Barry and Adam and obviously Spike it you know 40 Acres is an institution and it was so cool to be surrounded by all that really creative energy that was just sort of flying around and just you know you don't know where the story's gonna land sometimes um and that was really exciting do you feel like having worked in somebody on somebody else's edit or having, you know, worked for, you know, a master director like Spike or on a big project like this? Do you feel like that informed your directing style or did working on like did or did, you know, working on a doc inform the way you wanted to shoot or the way you wanted to direct in any way? You know, I worked on Epicenter as well after Killing Evan was finished. I wish I had worked on it actually before because the sort of toolbox that Adam mentored me with in terms of how to approach footage, the flexibility of the footage, using speed ramps, comps in the timeline, um, how to approach visual effects, how to look at, look at certain shots, how to, um, how to move things around in the edit and, and, and actually just like completely restructure a scene. I mean, I had kind of already had that intuitively and had learned that from working on other narrative projects, but Adam really honed that in for me. Um, as I was working with him, but, and also, but for me in terms of uh, some of the other narrative films that I had worked with, it definitely informed me in a sense of, I learned how to work backwards when I was working on narrative projects um, in the sense of, you see what's going on in the dailies, you see what was effective in terms of the director's, um, you know, what the director says to the actors and whether or not it works. And also, you know, I were, I worked on certain edits where it had a 79, 75% test rating. And then after we got audience feedback, it went up to an 85%. Um, and, you know, after working the edit many, many times and trying a million different things, you know, banging your head against the wall. I think if anything, that learning that an editorial helped me more so with the writing process because the writing process is very similar to that. Um, but I don't think it really prepared me what to expect when I produced and directed this because it was just, it was another story. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about Killing Evan because this story, um, it's a short film, but it's uh, very cinematic. And, I, and I'll talk to you later about the plans that you want to do with it, but I thought it came out very well. Um, 
give me a little like log line for the film. Tell me what it's about. And then I want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the, what you were alluding to before, like some of the challenges that you may have had with it. So when a poser bass player announces she got her noise punk band a gig in Brooklyn, her abusive boyfriend, the band's lead singer, flies into a fit of rage and dies suddenly. Determined to make it to Brooklyn for the big gig, a long road trip ensues accompanied by the ghost of her dead ex, forcing her to face the voices of doubt from her past as she steps into her future. You got some interesting themes. This is a very actor-driven, performance-driven, writer-driven kind of film. You're not relying on a lot of special effects and things like that. When you kind of approach this having seen and worked on the projects that you've worked on, did you have a few like do's and don'ts in mind? Or were, did you kind of discover some of the stuff like, you know, this being your first like real like directorial debut where you're like, oh, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> you know, what, what was the, what were some of the, what were some of the challenges and like the pitfalls and stuff? Well, I knew going in, I wanted to have a really strong script to rely on because, um, I think having worked in editorial, I sort of knew like the limitations of when when you do have a weaker script, it is a lot, it is much more of an uphill climb to sort of make up for that in the edit. And I also wanted to work through as much of the action and the ideas because there is so much action involved and you only have so much time to sort of shoot those scenes and to get them right. And it does take a lot of, you know, working through the actors of getting them through the motions and having them sort of prepare for that. Um, I had never shot any action, obviously I had never shot any action scenes before and I hadn't really worked on any action movies. So I was just really um, sh going with that intuitively. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so my whole mode of working was prepare as much as I can. Were there films that you looked at as kind of inspiration and you said, you know what, I like this scene from this movie or like, I want to kind of borrowed it what were your go-to like if in your lookbook what were you looking at yeah in my lookbook I had um stills from high tension I had stills from ladies and gentlemen the Fab fabulous stains originally a lot um a lot of the motivation to write this script came from came to me after I watched um Susan Seidelman's first feature Smithereens which um is sort of about this loner girl who wants to be a punk rock singer but none of the guys will let them into her band and she sort of falls into this sort of whirlwind destitute lifestyle um, after falling for like a bad rocker guy played by Richard Hell. Um, so a lot of a lot of that kind of like post-punk era vibes that I was sort of looking at but I also pulled a lot of images from like Nan Golden series um, Ballad of Sexual Dependency. Ballad of, uh, I think that's the name of it. Anyway, from you know the most famous Nan Golden photo series um and yeah I think the vibe that we were going for was as punk as it can be um our color palette was like we you know I, I don't think I can say this on the air urine and fecal matter that was our color palette um so, <laughs> and I think that's as punk as you can get really um, in terms of a color palette. So yeah, those, that was, those were sort of the films that inspired the look of it. Um, I definitely wanted to, I know no cell phones, very few visual effects. I wanted, if we were gonna do anything, it was gonna be practical because just knowing how much certain the effects cost, they actually do end up looking better practically even if they kind of falter or look a little gimmicky it's still better than actual getting someone to do gore or blood none of that turns out well no matter how much money you have I mean it takes at least 50 to 60 revisions to get it right so that wasn't really an option um so yeah I think that was that was sort of the approach in terms of um, me directing but the pitfalls and you know the challenges that I encountered I think to best sort of sum it up was the shoot fell apart three times. Um, <laughs> yeah, the shoot fell apart three times. Um, you know, whether it be my, you know, suddenly the first DP I hired moved out of town. Um, you know, I lost a location because I actually was originally going to shoot in a physical punk house located in Bushwick um, that had about 15 anarchists living in it. But of course, when you are um, dealing with actual anarchists, you know, expect to lose a location. Just don't even, don't bank on it. 
I don't even know why I was like, oh yeah, I totally convinced her. We're in. No problem, guys. I got this. Um, so after that, I, you know, it, it, you know, when, every time you lose a certain amount of momentum, you might lose crew. I lost crew after I lost the location. My producer and AD dropped out because they found, it was at, in 2019, so they found better jobs. Um, again, not griping. It's just every part of this process was so challenging. And it was kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. Every time I had solved something, another problem arose from that solution. <laughs> So when, so after we shot the first setup in the first take, I think I was just in a state of total um, disassociation because I was like, I can't even believe this just happened. I really didn't think it was going to happen. Did you have sort of a fail safe uh, plan? Like, oh, if we can't, if we don't get up, the, you know, if we don't uh, end up doing the whole movie, maybe I can get a trailer for a movie or did you kind of go like, is, is there, a, was there a smaller version of it or did it start out much bigger and ended up where it is now? Uh, no, it was really all or nothing for me. I'd spent um, maybe over a year and a half to two years on this script and there was no way that I was only going to do a section or a portion or anything like that. You know, all of it was self-funded. So I was like, it's getting done. I'm control of the money. I'm in control of, you know, so 90% of the process, giving, you know, the universe 10% in terms of its control over what would might happen or the total outcome of the film. But I was like, absolutely determined to make this script happen. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't want a backup plan. Is this something that's like, this is going to be my director calling card when someone says, what have you done? This is going to be my real piece. Or was it a piece that you wanted to do for itself and say, you know what, I've got bigger plans down the road. I want to make this into a feature, you know, uh, or was it just a short film to make a short film? I wanted it to be my writer and my director calling card. Um, I, you know, it's very easy and I'm not trying to, it's, it, it's hard to sort of move within departments and especially trying to get above the line once you're already below the line I found in my in my own personal experience and that's not me trying to talk negatively about the business it's just my own personal experience so I was really like how can I just break out in a different way because you know being an editorial as much as I love it I am I do yearn to have a little bit more of a creative hand in things and I do have a lot of stories that I enjoy writing that I would like other people to see um so with that being said, um, my the overall hope was like, look at what I can do, look at what I can write. Um, and I do think there are some really nice moments in the short where you do have these like really nice, uh, delicious, emotional moments that you can sort of hold on to. And I think, you know, those are hard to come by in any movie. Um, and I'm very proud of them. And I'm, I hope, you know, someone can see this film and be like, wow, she really, she went all out and we're impressed and we want to hire her. <laughs> right now too, like you're doing the festival circuit with it, which um, probably is a good move for you. I don't know if the festival circuit is right for everybody. Having myself spent the last three years uh, interviewing people at festivals, talking to festival directors. Uh, and of course, every festival director would tell you, of course you want to do the festival route. But I, I feel like, especially with short films, now there are opportunities to distribute them. Like some people want, like we interviewed uh, a gentleman from a, a site called We Short, and they're buying short films. They're trying to get the best short films from film festivals and stuff. I'm still not certain if there's a real market for it or at a certain point in your career, should you still be making short films other than just to get better at them and get, you know, be a better director and just have a better reel and stuff. Um, but I feel like, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree, but I feel like it's important if you're going to make a short film, and I would ask you for your advice of anybody looking to make their short first short film, to have some kind of a plan or a business plan for it, to make it with a purpose, uh, so that you're either, you know, you're either going to do it on the, on the lowest level, this is just to sharpen my skills and maybe nobody will see this, to uh, we're going to sell this or we're going to get this on the festival circuit, or this is my proof of concept short for a bigger project kind of thing. No, I think all three approaches that you listed are great reasons to make a short. Um, I, for me personally, I just really needed something to sort of pitch to other people so I could work on other projects that I have and to sort of use this as a way of like, look what I've done, but I can also do this and here's my script. Um, that's sort of my a game plan and my approach. I don't want 
to sell this really. I, to me, it would just be a bit bigger success if I could just get it on um, Vimeo short of the week and have as many people as I want to see it whenever they feel like it and, and for it to reach as many people as possible. Um, so they could have that Chris Marker La Jete moment with Killing Evan. Um, <laughs> But I, I think, you know, the, I think that's, to me, I think content is king right now. That's the way to get your name out to, to somehow have, I don't think shorts, shorts don't often go viral, but to get them on websites to, to be able to promote a link and to show as many people as you can, I think that's the best way of getting your voice out there. You know, it, it you do, in a sense, it is a financial loss, but you are investing in your future and you are investing in your voice. And to me, I think that is the, probably the most valuable thing you can do. Talked about challenges, but like, were you doing this during the pandemic or just pre-pandemic? Well, I actually started writing the script in 2017 and it wasn't until 20, end of 2018 that I had really finished it. And that's when I sort of, in the beginning of 2019, I began the journey of trying to get the shoot off the ground. But I, editorial, um, it did take me a lot longer because I was like working on, <laughs> I was working on two shows at once and sort of doing that at nights and I kind of burnt out. So I had to take a break, but I did finish the edit uh, October of 2020. Would you hire an editor at this point if you had the choice? You know, I did think about it because it's really hard, especially when you, I think I was, I was, I became very precious about the script um, because I'd spent so much time on it and it meant so much to me because it, it is a very personal story. And um, so when I put on my editor hat, I was very much in war with my other two selves of like to the, I was angry at the director for not getting what we needed to make it work. And then I was angry at the writer for forcing the writer to make the director be precious about the script and the shoot. And I don't, you know, I'm, we're still not talking, but hopefully we'll make amends soon because my editor self is very mad at my other two selves. But yeah, I mean, you want that. I think the great thing about having an editor on any project, I think this goes without saying, and it's pretty obvious, but you need that objective point of view in the room. You need someone who can talk you out of certain ideas or to throw certain ideas in the mix and to constantly be trying things rather than when you hit a wall, it becomes like this personal guttural thing of, oh, why, woe is me? Why can't I make this work? What's wrong with me? You, know, you just, you start to spiral, I think, um, when you have your hand, when you're so emotionally connected to a piece like this um so yes I did consider it but it was it was also like you know if I have anyone else edit this it's going to be miserable for them to have me in the room <laughs> it's going to be utterly miserable so I'm like you know what I think there should only be one person miserable during this process and that should be me that's really honest to say that um I've been there myself because I've edited a lot of my own work and now I have, I have like a dissociative disorder where I just kind of like, I look at it like who shot this, who, you know, and just like, you know, work with what you have. I think the best advice uh, is if you do have an editor, it's like when Walter Murch talks about editing, he says like, he doesn't see actors out of costume. He doesn't visit the set. He only deals with what he has, like the film that you shot is what he deals with. Not the film you wanted to shoot, not the film you wrote, but what you actually got. And you have to deal, like, I feel like the, you know, in the id ego, super ego sort of thing, the, it, the editor part is like that ego that says, this is, this is what happens. Now it's not right or wrong or good or bad. This is what you got. And this is what you need to deal with. Otherwise you're kind of screwed. You can't, you know, um, other, I, otherwise you'd, you'd be begging yourself to go out and do reshoots and, you know, things like that. Um, but which, you know, people have done. But, you know, on a short film, probably not worth it, you know. Um, is there any, uh, we're going to wrap up in a minute here, but is there any advice you would give to someone that, like, to avoid uh, the pain of the first directorial experience kind of thing? No, because it's going to be painful. No advice. I think just, you know, trying to stay as grounded as you can and just, I, I think, always coming back to the reason of why you want to do this always reminding yourself like your voice is important and 
staying true to your voice and the emotional story that you're trying to tell and always going back to that, having that as your North star as you sort of progress and always bringing yourself down whenever you're spiraling back to this realm of this is the story, these are the emotions, these are my characters. I care about them, I care about the story and it, I wouldn't be able to live without having told the story. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up, but for those who uh, might want to know more about you, possibly hire you, maybe stalk you online, uh, where can they find you? You can um, check out my editing work and a little info about Killing Evan at taylorlandisman.com. And you can stalk me on Instagram at underscore DJ Tate Bones. Yes, I used to be a DJ. That is true. Unfortunately. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll be sure to do that. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, thank you all out there for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And now you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Taylor Landisman, and our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.